skills and environment. All right, so let's review um, that section. First of all, rescues. All right, a um, couple of things. One person CPR is 30 compressions to two ventilations. All right, that is what we've been taught all right, in our first aid course. 30 compressions, two ventilations. Right. Now the truth of the matter is, right, in an exam question, that's what it is, 30 compression, uh, two ventilations. Um, if you get that wrong in real life, it doesn't really matter, okay? Um, but certainly for exam questions and the way we're being taught, 30 to two, all right? Um, near drowning, a near drowning must go to a hospital, all right? Why? Because that person could have inhaled water, right? That water sits in their lungs, right? It is uncomfortable, they may feel it, they may not feel it, right? And as they're lying down, going to sleep, the water actually is washing away the mucus that covers the alveoli in our lungs. In our lungs, we have something called alveoli. The alveoli are there to exchange the oxygen into the bloodstream, all right, they've got a mucus on them, water is on them, starts um, washing that away, they stick together, and you basically, it's a secondary drowning. You can drown in your own bed um, after, after um, having inhaled water. Unconsciousness, CPR and first aid effectively is most important, all right? So, Performing first aid and CPR in the best possible way is most important in order to um, bring somebody back from unconsciousness. Right. Um, an aquatic injury, chances are what's going to happen to you is you're going to have some local swelling. Right. Um, if you get stung by a jellyfish or come in contact with some coral that may um, have some stinging properties, I right, you will have a lot more than likely local swelling. Alrighty, what else are we look at? We're going to look at the buoyancy check. All right, um, it's really important for us as divers to be weighed appropriately. Okay, um, you're going to be open water scuba instructors. You're going to have a look at your students, all right, and you're going to guess roughly how many weights they need. Obviously, every person is different, all right. You have very skinny people, they may need less weights. You have very bigger people, they're gonna need more weights. You're gonna have people with small lung volumes, right? Five or six liters, they take a breath in, hardly anything, versus people that are taking big breaths, 12, 13, 14 liters, gonna be more buoyant. The wetsuits you're wearing, a shorty, five mil, a three mil, a long suit, all those things affect how much weight you will actually have to do. So a buoyancy check, all right, would be that at the surface of the water with our equipment, the BCD completely deflated, we're gonna take one deep breath in, and we should float, the book says at eye level, all right, somewhere there, we shouldn't basically sink, all right, so that air in our volume, that air in our lungs, should keep us afloat. When I exhale, let all that air out of my lungs, that's when I should sink. So if I sink with the breath in, I have too much weight on. If I don't sink when I exhale, I don't have enough weights on. All right? So that's how I would do a buoyancy check. Other parts of skills, distance measure. All right? Uh, the most accurate would be arm spans. All right? So you're swimming along, putting your finger in the sand, swimming along, that's two arm spans, three arm spans, so on and so forth. That is the most accurate. Kick cycles are affected by current and kicking strength. All right? So a kick cycle is once up and once down. All right? That is one kick cycle. Now, if you're swimming into the current, you're going to be using more kick cycles than if you're turning around and coming back again. All right? Um, different people cover different distances with their kick cycles. So my kick cycles might be different from Jack's, might be different from Steve, might be different from Mark's. Right? So kick cycles, again, is a good indication, but can be affected by things. Right. 
Other skills, search patterns are determined by bottom topography, size of the object, size of the search area, water conditions and visibility. All right, so let's have a look at that. Bottom topography, all right. If I'm looking for something that is, and I'm just on a sandy patch, all right, there's nothing but sand, all right, um, that would be very, very different to if I'm looking at something that's over a coral reef. Sandy patches, it just sticks out. You can see it straight away. All right. So, um, whereas topography, I might have to be much more careful in what I'm looking at. The size of the object. All right. If I'm looking for an outboard engine, it's big. I can see it. All right. So I may be doing a U search pattern because I know it's in that direction and just keep on going until I find it, all right? Whereas if I'm looking for a small piece of jewelry, all right, I'm obviously concentrating just on a small area trying to find it, so I might actually do just with a, uh, with a, with a rod, with a reel, for example, one partner holds one end of the line, I hold the other end of the line, I swim around in a circle and just really concentrate on that one area, all right, letting go, coming back a bit, and then concentrating on the next area. All right, size of the search area. Obviously, you know, if I'm looking for a small object in a small area versus that engine block that I know is somewhere in this direction. All right, water conditions and visibility. Visibility obviously is a very important one. All right, if I have 20 meter visibility, I can do my use search pattern in much bigger sections than if I have only five meter visibility, all right? You guys learn to dive in four or five meter visibility, half a meter visibility, <laughs> all right? Uh, yeah, so obviously search patterns have that. The other thing is, when I'm searching for something, I don't wanna be right on the bottom, all right? If I'm looking for a larger object, I wanna have that helicopter view, all right? So I wanna be probably five or 10 meters above the surface, again, depending on the size of the object, so I can look at everything now. All right, search patterns, we have U-shapes. All right, straightforward. So I would start here, that's the mooring block, and I was told that the object that I'm looking for is, say, in 207 degrees in that direction, all right? And this is where it was actually lost. So a use search pattern, what I would do is I would set my compass in that direction, turn 90 degrees to it, and start off in this direction. Come back up, and go across. Up, and across. Until such a point that I actually end up finding the object that I'm looking for. Alright, use search pattern. Alright, versus a circular one, as I said, basically I'm holding on to a bit of rope or a, a, a safety reel or something like that, two people, I'm doing a circle, then letting that rope out a little bit and doing a circle again, versus an expanding square, I'm starting at a central point and working my way out and making that square with every 90 degree turn bigger and bigger. So this is something I would use that if I know the central location is going to be somewhere here and I would expand out versus I know it's somewhere in that, that direction, I would do my U-search pattern to find it in that direction. All right. Okay. Using a lift bag. <laughs> All right. That sounds really funny. I should use a lift bag as soon as something is more than four kilos. All right. According to what Paddy says, that's when we should be using a lift bag if it's more than four kilos. All right, all right. Um, special equipment for night dives. All right, again, under the skills, uh, we have a torch. We should have a backup torch. And the material still says that we have a chemical glow sticks. But certainly today, with the amount of plastic in the ocean and the amount of one-used products that we have, um, we are going away from that. All right, but yeah, for our purposes, those are the um, answers that still are there. Um, another question that might come up is, what is Discover Local Diving? 
Discover local diving is a lot of people confusing with discover scuba diving. Discover scuba diving is an introductory dive. I've never dived before. I'm taking somebody as an instructor on their first dry dive. Discover scuba dive. Right? Discover local diving is I am a certified diver. I've never been there before. And you as a dive master and instructor are going to show me the area. Okay, orientation dive and a new area dive site you have not experienced before. Right? So just keep that in mind. That's the difference. Let's have a look at the environment. All right, the ocean. All right, Earth should be called not Earth, should be called water. Seventy-one percent of it is covered in water. All right, um, we know more about the moon's surface than we do about the bottom of the ocean. Think about that. We live here. We know more about the moon's surface than we do about the bottom of the ocean. Okay. We have something called a hydrological cycle. All right. So basically, this is explaining to us what happens to the water and why does it rain. Okay. So you have sun evaporating water from the oceans and from the lakes and from freshwater storage places. All right. That water evaporates up into the atmosphere. All right. And eventually condensates and turns into clouds. Right. They're moving along, all right, and they start becoming really heavy, and we end up with rain, right, or up in high areas we end up with snow, right. Water comes down, runs off through freshwater lakes, filters through subsurface flow, groundwater, all right, and makes its way back into the ocean eventually. So all the rain eventually, somehow, or somewhere ends up back in the ocean. So that we call a hydrological cycle. Alright, other questions we may have a look at is we have five oceans. We have the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Indian, the Arctic, and the Southern Ocean. Alright? Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, Southern, Arctic, Indian, and again Pacific, so this is the other side. Alright? And of course the equator across the top here. Right. Okay. Um, the Mariana Trench. Mariana Trench is sort of north of Papua New Guinea. Right. It is the deepest part of the ocean. It's 11,000 meters deep, so 11 kilometers deep. The average ocean depth is about 3,700 meters, so on average, but really quite deep. Right. Um, 36,200 feet, or oh yeah, about 11,000 meters. Right. Um, this would be the top of Mount Everest <coughs> if we were to put it down in the Mariana Trench. Alright. Alright. So those are all things to remember. This is an interesting one to remember as well especially when we're considering about ocean currents and where it is warm to dive and where it is cold to dive. All right? So, ocean currents, they go clockwise in the northern hemisphere and anti-clockwise in the southern hemisphere. All right? The way I try to remember this, all right? Northern hemisphere is clockwise. Okay? It goes right hand around. All right? Now, most parts in the Northern Hemisphere, except for the UK, we all drive on the right hand side on the road. Alright, right hand clockwise. Alright, more places in the Southern Hemisphere, like Australia, where we do things backwards, we drive on the left hand side of the road, alright, and it goes counterclockwise. That's just a little hint on how to remember it. So, Northern Hemisphere clockwise. Southern Hemisphere anti-clockwise. All right. Now, what's interesting about that is that that affects water temperature. All right. Warm water on the east coast of Australia. So, on the east coast of Australia, if we look here, the current actually runs from north to south. So, it's bringing the warm water from the equator down the east coast. All right. On the west coast of Australia, right, 
it is the other way around. It's bringing the cold water from south back up to the north on that coast. All right. So down here, if we're comparing temperatures, on this side, much warmer, on this side, much colder. All right. Um, think about the Caribbean. All right. Again, we are having the equator here. All right. Warm water coming up. Yet on this side, it's much colder the water, cold water from the north coming back down. All right. So thinking about that, very easy to remember. Just think about which way the currents go. All right, and then just picture the continent or the country to see where the warm water would be coming from. All right, and that all has to do with the ocean currents. We happy with that? Yeah. Cool. All right. Again, with environment, diving in currents, dive into the current so that as you're swimming along, you're doing the hard bit and then you're turning around and the current is bringing you back towards where you started from. Another good reason to do this, even if there's only a slight current, due to the tides, the current could actually increase, right? So it's, if you're not doing it, it'd be actually harder to swim against this current. So you want to make sure into the currents and let the current bring you back. All right, more about currents, rips. All right, um, especially here in Australia on the East Coast, especially sort of Gold Coast, Surface Paradise, Sunshine Coast, we have a lot of rips. All right, um, what rips are are basically sandbanks on either side. All right a buildup of water on this side as the waves crash over those sandbanks and then all that water is going to make its way back through the middle of that. All right. This rip current is going to bring you out into the deep ocean rather quickly and you cannot swim against the current for very long. Okay? You're not going to make it. So your escape is to the right or to the left, parallel to the beach and then making your way back in. All right. You can see rips quite easily. All, right. all this area here looks nice and calm and inviting. That's why people go swimming there. All right. But it actually drags you out to sea. All right, environment. Upwelling and downwelling currents. Um, certainly an upwelling is that the water is coming up and a downwelling is the water is coming down. All right? Very prevalent, these ones, certainly in Indonesia. You have huge currents over there. All right? And down currents can obviously be very, very dangerous as they're dragging you deep. All right? uh, upwellings can as well because you could ascend too quickly, but certainly um, an upwelling is not as dangerous as a downwelling because that can bring you deeply out of the water. Let's have a look at waves, breaking waves. Um, waves are created primarily by wind, all right, or seismic underwater events. We've heard of tsunamis, obviously, all right, volcanoes or earthquakes um, creating a tsunami, which then can travel for miles and miles and miles, get on land and inundate um, things. Landslide, gravity, and flatten waves. All right, so what's happening here with waves? The wind is creating the waves is basically pushing the water in one direction, okay, causing those ebbs and lows. Right. Deep water moves here, very quite deep. The waves are really not affected by anything. Once we come into shallower water, all right, the bottom bit of that water is actually slowed down by the bottom and makes the top of the wave starting to fall forward. And then again, it gets shorter as well. This rotation, the wave actually then breaks over to the shore. All right? So that is how the waves will break. All right? The crest is the distance top of the wave. All right? So that is the crest right here. Wave length is the distance from crest to crest, from there to there. All right. The trough is the distance bottom of the wave. 
right? And the height of the wave is the distance from trough to crest. So just a couple of terminologies for us to remember. Tides. How do tides um, come about? It's a gravitational pull of the moon and the sun, but the majority from the moon. Okay, so you have the moon over here, all right, sucking all that water to one side, all right, that's creating a high tide there and a low tide over here, all right. The sun as well has an effect on the tides, but certainly the moon by far the bigger one, all right. In, um, in a place in, uh, I believe, Northern Australia it is, you actually have this big, huge inland lake, Right? with just a relatively small gap for all that water to come in and out. Right? You can have currents running in and out of there as fast as 12, 15 knots. So if your boat doesn't do any faster than 12 or 15 knots, you're actually stationary as that water moves. Right? Horizontal Huge amount of force. Sorry? Horizontal force. Horizontal force, yes, exactly. Right. All right. And as far as skills and environment is concerned, that's um, what we need to concern ourselves with, and that's sort of the most important things that we need to remember. Any questions on that?